Vertigo, if you could just start up by uh, introducing yourself. Okay. I'm Christian C. Hine, Sr. And, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, which branch of the service did you... Uh, I was in the uh, uh, Army. Um, can you tell us how you came to enlist? What uh, Were you drafted? I, I was drafted. Okay. And uh, first one in our area, uh, unfortunately. But uh, I was dra drafted, yes. Uh, which area? Uh, Kensington and Philadelphia. Okay. Um, how old were you at the time? Was I 21? Yes. yes, I think I was 21. And did you have uh, any brothers or sisters? Yes, I have uh, one brother and two sisters. Okay. They're all deceased now. Okay. Um, could you tell us uh, what happened? Uh, where did they send you uh, when you first got drafted? Okay, we first went to uh, Fort Meade, and we went there. As a matter of fact, I have. Should have something. I went to Fort Meade. That's where we were classified, and we were given an aptitude test. Okay. And uh, then, depending upon your. Uh, uh, how you came out in the, uh, the aptitude test determined just where you were going to be sent. Uh, how did yours come out? I came out good. I, I was, I was uh, 124 out of 140. So, so where, where were you sent then? I was sent down to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The, the artillery, uh, it was an artillery, uh, can, or a, yeah, an artillery base at the time. Can you uh, tell? Can you tell us a little bit about the training that you received at uh, at camp? Yes, I guess I can. The uh, thing that I remember most was that we had gotten in late at night, somewhere in the area. I would say past midnight, <coughs> and Reveille was at six o'clock, so we got very little sleep. We got in by the time we got unpacked. Uh, you were well into the early hours of the morning, and so we got very little sleep. And we had to get out for Reveille at 6 o'clock. So uh, wh wh how were your instructors? Uh, what, what type of training were you given? Well, uh, first, in basic training, you go through the uh, uh, how to uh, form the line, how to march, cadence, uh, then we, we went into the area of um, close order drill, mm -hmm. and for eight weeks, we, this is the way we progressed until we finally got to the uh, point where we were then at <coughs> working with the artillery pieces okay. and firing the guns. Okay. Um. Do you have any interesting uh, or interesting stories about the time when you were in training camp? Any, make any uh, close friends? Or yeah, anything? I think I have one in particular. Um, we first, when we first went on the firing line, went up to uh, what they were going to do as grade us on how well we could fire a rifle. Right. So we lined up, and I had. Uh, 22 rifle at home, and I used to go out occasionally and shoot. But you get up there, we're given a rifle, given ammunition, and we had targets. Oh, they were about, I'd say, maybe 500 yards away. Okay. And uh, so it was load, lock, fire. So get up there, and I loaded. I locked and I fired, and the breastplate came out. <laughs> so I went off the line, got another rifle, got up there, went through the same routine, only when I pulled the trigger this time, shell came out and hit me in the nose. I, they pulled me off the line again. They uh, put a bandage on it, and I was back in. Well, make the long story short, I had what they called Maggie's drawers every time I fired. <laughs> I didn't care where I was firing, I just fired. And I, 
I didn't have a very good score. Maggie's drawers mean you missed the target. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was the... So, a good thing you went in the artillery then, not the... Yeah, uh, I think so. It worked much, that much better than it did in the infantry. Uh, where did you go uh, once uh, you got out of uh, training camp? Um, then I went up on Cadre to... Um, we were, there was a new division forming in Camp Atterbury, Indiana. Okay. And uh, eight of us uh, went up to Camp Atterbury. Okay. Uh, so we would then be training the, uh, the troops who were up there. Uh, can you tell me about uh, the training that you gave? Or were you trained... Or were you training on? I but training was basically what we had in basic training. Right. We, we sort of told them how to line up, how to to about face, you know, do all the uh, necessary things in that respect. Um, where were you? I, I guess. Uh, how did you uh, get from the United States to uh, to England? To England, mm -hmm. we um, after Camp Atterbury, we finished the uh, basic training there for the division. Uh, we moved from there down to uh, Camp Breckenridge, Breckenridge Kentucky. Okay. Uh, this was a 60-mile hike from Camp Atterbury down to Breckenridge. We stayed there for approximately two months, and then we, uh, uh, we boarded trains and left for Camp Shanks, New York. What, what did they have you doing for those two months in uh, Breckenridge? In Breckenridge, we were on tra we trained. We had maneuvers. We performed what we would do in in, if, in combat. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, once you were in New York, uh, how long did you wait there? We were there about four days. And we got there on April the third. I know it well because that's the date I was inducted into the service. So uh, we. We were there for four days, then we, we were taken by uh, bus out to uh, the pier where uh, the ship was waiting for us, and we boarded there. Uh, how long was the uh, trip across? Oh, well, let's see, it was 10 days. Did you have any uh, uh, fears about U-boats while you were uh, crossing? Or? No, we, we were very fortunate. We went in convoy. Okay. And on our uh, let's see, on our port side, we had destroyers, and on the uh, the uh, what do they call the other side? Well, the other side we Starboard. had what? Okay, Starboard. Starboard. Thanks. Um, we had a the battleship um, battleship Texas. And we were well cordoned into that group. To, I don't see how a submarine could have gotten anywhere near us. <laughs> and that's how we traveled over to, to landed in Liverpool. Okay. Uh, where did you go from Liverpool? Liverpool, we went, to, and I think I can. Now, if I may, sure. either you can either copy it from this, uh, or. Uh, you want me to say it? Okay. Uh, we arrived in uh, Liverpool uh, on the 16th, 1944. We went to Camp Brynny Piss. That's B R Y N Y P Y S. And that is in Flintshire, Wales. F L I N T S H I R E. We moved from there on the 2nd of May to Camp Ashton in Shropshire, England, S-H-R-O-P-S-H-I-R-E, first Camp Ashton, A-S-T-O-N. What unit were you? What you, were you 83rd Infantry. 83rd Infantry, yes. And you were in the artillery? Yes. At what rank? Well, at that time, I was a staff sergeant. Okay. Um, what, what, was, uh, what was the basic equipment you were using? Uh, and, uh, we had 105 
artillery pieces. We had 155 millimeter artillery pieces. Mm -hmm. Basically, that's what we had. And uh, what were your duties then, uh, well, at this time? Well, at that time, I had uh, gone to school on IB, uh, and um, when I graduated from school, I was then promoted, and I was the message center chief, and I used to take all the uh, firing data and uh, use take the firing data, and then I would uh, code it. And this information went out to all the the artillery battalions, and that was their firing assignment for the next day, or even if if uh, necessary at night. Um, how was uh, well? I guess uh, how was the uh, leadership of your uh, immediate chain of command? How were your uh, immediate officers? How did they how did they function? Um, we had. Uh, we had the, the, uh, the st 83rd uh, Division Artillery staff there, which uh, uh, was comprised of the uh, Brigadier General. And then he, in turn, had uh, two lieutenant colonels. And then there were three uh, three majors. And then there was uh, one captain. And then we had a captain that was uh, our commanding officer in our part of the battery. Um, how long were you in England? We were in England until, yeah, I can give you that. Sure. Uh, we did a, uh, I might include this, we did a lot of uh, artillery firing okay. throughout England. And uh, we actually, got to the area of Stonehenge, England. I don't know if you're familiar with that. We, we camped there. And uh, the, I just traveled from one place to the other, firing, just in, in practice firing. And uh, until we boarded the, uh, until we got to Portland. And in Portland, we, that um, was Portland Harbor in England, uh, near Weymouth. And we boarded the LST number seven to go across to Normandy. Well, how, what were your uh, What were you thinking when you were boarding? Was it Did you uh, Could you tell us how you're feeling? Uh, no, actually, uh, we took everything in stride. We knew we were going in. We knew what was going to happen. Um, before we went in, uh, on our way. We had a uh, we had to do a mail run, and this coincided with D Day, and we heard the, all the conversations going on in the, the with the people that have landed or were, were landing, and uh, one captain in particular, I'll never forget this, one captain in particular hollered door the mic, where's the goddamn artillery? We're getting massacred here. And boy, you know, at that point we were ready to go. Is that, uh, we got back, got on the OST and we went, came over to Normandy. Uh, can you tell me about uh, the day you came over on the LST? Uh, well, it was pretty much standard. We, we boarded the uh, LST. Uh, we each had our own compartments. The, uh, that was the, uh, like, from staff sergeant up. And uh, the rest of the uh, battery would, was uh, housed down on the lower decks. Um, did you say that uh, the day you came over was the, uh, the day of the storm? Yes. Could you that's tell when, that's when we had the five-day storm. Could you talk? Could you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, surprisingly, we had very few people get seasick. Okay. And uh, and as I say, like when we landed, everyone took it in stride, mm -hmm. and they did what they were told. And 
uh, we pretty much were well organized and we had no problems going in. I don't remember anyone getting seasick, mm -hmm. even though we were going around in circles for five days. Why were we going around in circles for five days? Well, we were going around because we lost our sea anchor, our, our forward steer, what's the word? Starboard sea anchor. So consequently, we were just rotating around the one sea anchor we had left. Mm -hmm. and uh, For five days? For five days. When the, when the uh, storm receded, that's when we went in. We landed on the beach. We landed on the beach and not in the harbor? And nor, not in the, no, the harbor was already, was gone. It had been washed away by the, the storm. It was a fierce storm. Right. And uh, then we landed and, and debarked at that point in Omaha Beach. When was the first time that you were uh, ever under enemy fire? Shortly after we left the beach, we took artillery fire. And... Uh, to go 14 miles into where we initially, where we were going to uh, relieve the 101st Airborne Carantan, um, we we had uh, I can think of at least three or four occasions when we did have artillery fire. Was anybody ever injured, or uh, with with this uh, fire? This was there were. Trying to hit Pretty us. Heavy. Was it? <laughs> yeah, they were. We kept on the move. So, can you tell me about uh, uh, your movements from Normandy through to when you got to the German border? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, we started out. We uh, we we um, stayed in Carentan on the peninsula in Carentan, France, for a period of a, I guess. A, about, let's see, I better refer to these. All right, we stayed in Carentan until the, the 7544. Okay. And uh, we moved up to Hotat in France uh, on 713. And uh, this is about the time that we had this uh, St. Lowe breakthrough. We had uh, the just, we had pushed the Germans back that far. And, uh, which was a, really was a short distance, no more than about two miles. Mm -hmm. But between our outfit and the uh, Germans, there was a, uh, a river, but there was a dam at the uh, one end of the river and the Germans blew it. Mm -hmm. So it formed a, a, a lake between the two. We had no place to go. The infantry had no place to go, but over through that, we sustained a number of casualties in that. People who could just get hit enough to the, the point where they were, uh, uh, let's say, they were they just grazed and they'd sink under the water because they were, you know, they were out, knocked out. And uh, we lost a lot to that when we had casualties from people that had gotten killed. We lost a lot there. Yeah. How, about, uh, how about your fire missions? Were you firing a lot? Was it uh, 24 hours or? Uh, yes, it was 24 hours a day. And what would your, like, what would your duties be during this time? Like, what would you be doing? Well, I was, uh, I, with my agents, we were taking uh, the uh, message of the fire aid, the uh, data to the various uh, artillery battalions. We had four battalions. And you, you, you mentioned your agents. Could you describe uh, what, what an agent is? Yeah, basically I had two people from each of the four battalions. There were eight people there. I had people from the uh, anti-aircraft anti -aircraft unit. We had people from the engineers, and there were two from each one. I had ended up with somewhere around, it varied, 
Sometimes I had 16, sometimes I had 24, depending upon what units joined us mm -hmm. at the point where we were trying to break through. Right. Um, could you tell me about the agents? Were any of them, uh, were they characters or were they, uh, uh, did you get to know any of them? I got to know Pretty them well? all well, mm -hmm. yes. Um, I had a w wonderful group of people, uh, except for the one that I, the, the drunkard, uh, but uh, I got rid of him. But uh, they responded, and the order I gave, they responded. They went out, they were had a Jeep, mm -hmm. and usually they had a sh shotgun with them, and uh, they would deliver their the best information to the various uh, units, including the air the aircraft and the, the uh, larger art artillery units that joined us. And uh, they really did a fine job. On the, yeah, we, uh, we lost two. But uh, of course, they were replaced immediately. But it, mostly, the, the two was from ambushes. And uh, pardon me. This, this gets me. But we, after we broke out of uh, Saint Lo, we got down, went down toward Avranches, okay. and uh, reformed down there. Uh, you mentioned uh, one fellow who, um, I think uh, earlier you said it might have been an artist. Yes. Did you have uh, something that you might uh, want to show today? Well, yes, I do. I think I have. Yes, I have this, this is on V-mail. This is what we used to send home uh, as a letter, but in this particular case, okay. Now, what was the, uh, what was the purpose of this? Uh, this why, why was this? <laughs> I don't know. I just got this one day. Mm -hmm. He said, here, Sergeant, here's something for you. Um, you can put it down. So uh, when you reformed at Avranches, uh, then uh, can you take us through what happened after that? Sure. Um, We went to, we left on uh, uh, July 13th um, from Hotot, and we went, then went to, to um, South, well, I hope I pronounce this correctly, Marchenau, in France, mm -hmm. and uh, just stayed one, one overnight, and then we went into Fugueres. F E U G E R E S. Now, when you went to these different locations, was each time uh, you would dig in and provide support? Yes. yes. So, and how, how long would you stay uh, at each place? It would vary. It depended upon how fast the uh, uh, armored divisions were moving. Which, uh, where, uh, which corps were you attached to? Who was the uh, army uh, commander? This this varied. I was with. I, we went in in Normandy with the Third Army, and then we went to the Ninth Army, and we would go back and forth from one army to the other, depending upon you know where we were needed most. Uh, I just want to go back. You mentioned earlier about um, uh, the time when you were on the LST and you lost the sea anchor. Um, did you? Was there? Uh, did you have a, uh, something to say about um, one time when you were were you being bombed at that time? Yes, or? we had we had a uh, German. There were very there weren't very many German planes in the air mm -hmm. because most of them had been either shot down or the air the uh, airfields had been bombed. Uh, but we we call him Axis Sally because he'd come over at night. 
and just around dusk, and he'd drop one bomb and keep on going. So uh, uh, he didn't really do very much damage at all, or very little damage, I should say. Uh, when you were in France, um, how, how were the civilians? How did, how did uh, they greet you? Oh, with open arms, really. When we landed in, when we were in Normandy, and uh, where we bivouacked one night because of the heavy shelling we were getting, and uh, so we pulled back, and they came out, they brought us uh, uh, whatever they had, you know, the little that they had, mm -hmm. and they came over, they were very friendly. Did you ever uh, have any um, uh, interesting stories that they may have told you or that uh, anything that happened with uh, the, the civilians? Um, we had to uh, give you a good example on the, how the uh, French responded to us. Um, going down the road, and I was one, uh, I was going with one of the agents, mm -hmm. and uh, I replaced the person that there and uh, as we were going down these French people jumped up and they said nice nice bosh bosh the Germans were just ahead so we immediately turned around and got out of the area because all I had was a carbine and a 45 and the driver had a carbine rifle also and we were no would be no match for their what they were carrying that's, that's really nice. Um, I guess if you want to uh, uh, continue with your story about uh, from... Sure. Um, we went to... Uh, we left that area on 729 and we uh, stopped in on 8-5 in uh, Chateau Neuf. And then this, we were there in a firing position for about uh, five days, yes, to 8-10. Then uh, we went to Denon, Denon, France, and this was on the Brittany Peninsula. Now we spent from Eight five till nine thirteen in that area. In Brittany, and the reason in Brittany, yes, because there was a um, um, the Germans were holed up at two places. First, they were on an island off the uh, um, Brittany coast, and uh, they were firing. They had heavy artillery and they were fire, firing it in on the uh, infantry and it, uh, our location. Um, we then, uh, then we had this, uh, what do they call it? It was a fortress. Mm -hmm. And this was right on out at the edge of the uh, uh, Peninsula there, and they was a, it was a heavy contingency of uh, German soldiers in there, and uh, we had our armor uh, come in, and they were blasting away at this, trying to get them. First of all, they uh, they called a truce, and they wanted to, them to surrender, and the commanding officer said, "We Germans do not surrender." We fight to the death. Mm -hmm. So everything started all over again. We started firing. Finally, uh, the people, uh, we had a, a unit of uh, heavy artillery come in. And they were firing on this island out in, uh, well, it's actually in the Atlantic Ocean there. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Evidently, they were doing such damage, you know, in spite of the fact that the people had tunnels there into the, the island, 
and that's where they had their their uh, artillery pieces. And uh, so uh, they decided that they had had enough and put up the white flag and surrendered to us. And then it left just the fortress. And uh, I think uh, the Germans finally got the idea that, was, you know, we've had enough. And they, re they uh, also surrendered. Was this Cherbourg? This was in Cherbourg. And mm -hmm. uh, actually, um, we were in, uh, what was the other? You know, I can't think of the name of that town. Did you get to go into Cherbourg, or did they uh, immediately pull you off somewhere else? No, the, the, what happened was uh, uh, we pulled back, and uh, the uh, 4th Infantry Division went into Cherbourg, Cherbourg and uh, uh, they overran that. Uh, Was it yeah, Saint Lamar, Saint Malo, Malo. Okay. And it's the asylum. Pardon me. I'm sorry. You said Saint Malo, oh. M A L O. And that's where you, that's where you're staying. And uh, this uh, was an area where they uh, they were also planning an invasion, but it never uh, never came about because once our uh, uh, enemy decided to call it quits, we pulled back and that was the end of that. Okay. Where did you go after uh, after Brittany? Then we headed south toward, uh, we, be, uh, we controlled the south perimeter uh, for the uh, Third Army mm -hmm. and we had about a 150 mile stretch and we were to protect the, the south perimeter. And we stayed there for, I guess, till September 22nd. Okay. And uh, an interesting thing happened during in that time frame. Um, it was very quiet. We were uh, no firing, nothing. We were just there guarding. They had a, um, they sent a patrol, a lieutenant and uh, a squad of uh, men down to see how far they could go before they were fired upon. And they got all the way down to the border of Switzerland. No one unbeknownst to them or anyone else. In the meantime, the, the uh, German army started to move from southern France and come up toward where we were. And this lieutenant was way back, saw the Germans, and he went over, drove into camp where they were bivouacked, and he asked, wanted, he demanded to see the commanding general. The commanding general came out, and they discussed surrender. Now this sounds like a fairy tale, but this is actually what happened. And so he finally convinced the general that you have nowhere to go. You have the sea behind you. You have three different armies in front of you. What are you going to do? And this is I'm putting this in my perspective. And uh, so the general agreed that he would surrender, but then he, he, 
said he had two conditions. One is that we send airplanes over and bomb, but not bomb the, the area where they were in. This was to save face more than anything else. Then the other condition was that his, all of his soldiers would be treated fairly. And so the lieutenant took this information back to our headquarters and uh, the commanding general of our division and uh, his staff then went down and negotiated with them and they marched up uh, to, uh, oh, what was the town? I'm sorry, I don't have the name of the town. Do you remember the name of the lieutenant? And uh, the lieutenant uh, was with, with the, uh, the general staff, our general staff, mm -hmm. and uh, he explained the situation. And uh, the commanding general, the German general, uh, offered his sword to our commanding general, and the general refused. And uh, they, so they put them in a... a a POW camp, mm -hmm. and uh, we had arms stacked, I guess, not as high as this, you know, but we had arms stacked, I guess there were six or eight feet, and, and a large cage of, uh, of uh, armament. And uh, so uh, we, were, we pulled out after, shortly after that, went up into Luxembourg. Do you remember uh, the names of the lieutenant or the general? Or I have the, the name of the lieutenant at home, and I huh? probably, if, if I can find it, I'll be glad to. Uh, but it was uh, General, uh, uh, first the Major General, um, I just forgot his name, Macon, Major General Macon. And oh, then Brigadier General, Montague okay. and their staff. Um, oh, did he? Uh, did the lieutenant uh, in that case? Did he get any citation or credit for? Yes, he got a citation. He didn't get a promotion, but he got a citation. <laughs> um, so, what? What? Could you tell me about what happened when you went to Luxembourg? Well, when we went into Luxembourg, it was a pretty stagnant area. And uh, so we stayed there for, let's see how long we're in Luxembourg. We stayed there from 922-44 to 1118-44. Um, how was the uh, how was the pace of I guess uh, combat at this time? Were you still firing a lot of missions? Or? Uh, no, at that time we were pretty much in a, a holding pattern. We uh, uh, it was a good chance to uh, with the whatever replacements we had to train them, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, other than that we were just holding as we had been doing in uh, southern France. But this was. Uh, on the eastern salient of Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. Luxembourg and uh, just across the river was Trier. And uh, so we held that salient. Uh, I guess until... Oh, okay. Um, can, I, can I diverse for a minute? Uh, the 4th Division was fighting in the Hurricane Forest, which was oh. north of around Aachen. And they lost so many people that they had to pull them out. And uh, 
So we were then sent up to the area where they were. You were in the, the battle in the Hurricane Forest? Yes. Up in the, we were in a town called Grasnik. It, I'll spell it for you if I can find it here. Yeah, G-R-E-S-S-E-N-I-C-H. What, what was that like? Uh, just compare with what you were just in in southern France. Oh, can I, can you get rid of that? I, I made a mistake. Well, what's, um, what would you like to say instead? All right. Uh, we actually, on 11-14, we were in Hesperange in Luxembourg. Okay. H-E-S-P-E-R-A-N-G-E. And that's when we pulled out of uh, uh, there, and the 4th Division came in for R&R &R replacement and, and uh, relaxation, actually. They were, they were really decimated. They lost something around, I have it at home, but I'll, I'll say around uh, six, 7,000 men. Division? Yeah. There's 15,000 in division, but not all those are combat, you know, combatants. Uh, and we relieved them. How was your experience in that battle? Uh, we took, really took a beating. Uh, one thing I'll never forget. Uh, the Graves registration came up, and they were actually between the Germans and the Americans, they did call a truce till they could get the wounded and the dead out. And uh, we happened to be right in a location where the graves registration people brought the bodies. They had not only American bodies, they had German bodies. And what really, really got to me was the fact that they were stacking them pretty much like cordwood. They had that many people that had been killed in this experience or in this one campaign. Uh, we stayed uh, there until the start of the bulge, the Battle of the Bulge, and that was the 16th of December. Uh, how was was it? How was the weather at that time? Was it uh... bitter? Yeah, we we didn't have we didn't have very much snow, mm -hmm. but it was bitterly cold. Did that affect uh, your operations? It affected the artillery. How did it, how did it affect it? In, in the fact that uh, um, under certain conditions you. You cannot fire. If the temperature gets too low, you couldn't fire. So, and another thing that uh, Hurricane Forest was so heavily wooded, wooded, um, wooded, and the Germans had so many uh, covered foxholes in the area that you never could tell where they were. and. Uh, this is this is why we had so many casualties, and but they, they, they their casualties were, I would have to assume by what our infantry had had killed. But uh, I I don't recall how many. I never bothered to count the bodies that were there, but it was it was we had quite a number of dead bodies, both sides. What type of uh, I guess fire missions would you would they ask from for you? Do you, do you fire smoke or? Uh, well, most of it was um, were tree bursts. And in other words, they'd fire a, a shell that. If it came in any contact, the small limbs or whatever, with a uh, 
the forest. They, the shell would burst and put a, uh, and all of the uh, shrapnel would fly out, which was caused a lot of the damage. And we were firing that, and the Germans were firing it. But why tree bursts? What did what did that? Because you got it was like a scatter shot. With if you were firing a, a shotgun, for instance, mm -hmm. scattered. It hit something, and burst. The shell would burst. That's the way it was timed, and it would spread the shrapnel that was in the um, shell and just spread it over a large area. And that's how you received a lot of wounds. And, and, and um, if you were close enough to casualties, real casualties, deaths. Are there any other uh, memories of the Hurricane uh, battle that uh, you can remember right now? No, I, I, no, I really can't. Well, what hap um, Could you tell me then uh, what happened when? Uh, how did you first hear about the uh, the Battle of the Bulge? Like, what was here? What did well, you hear? The first message we got was when German planes started to fly over our area in uh, Gresnik. Uh, we were told, hold your fire. Don't fire at the air. Craft, let them go by because they wouldn't, didn't want to uh, didn't want them to see our positions. So uh, they flew on, and then we got word uh, I don't know exactly how it came about. I don't know whether it, we had radio contact or whether we had. Um, messengers come up, tell us that the Germans had broken through. It was actually was the area that we had left, where the 4th Division had gone in. And they came through there. And that was the start of the Battle of the Bulge. Um, we immediately got all the gear together, and we took off south to our salient, where we, what were we, where we were going to be assigned. And uh, we went down. We stopped in. Uh, we were on the East uh, Salient, and we had uh, there were five little, uh, six little towns in that particular area. We were where we were um, assigned, mm -hmm. and uh, this is where the the one push of the German, the Germans were looking for gasoline. There were gasoline, the gasoline uh, was in Liège, and then there was another gas dump closer, which is what we actually were guarding. And we, but we pulled as far in front as we could. And uh, the, uh, so we stayed in there, we had, uh, the British, our, uh, British division came up on our uh, uh, left salient. The Free French were on our right. There was only one problem. You could never trust the Free French. Why is that? Uh, if the fighting got too hot, they'd just take off. Unfortunately, the side, I don't like saying that, but uh, uh, we, uh, fortunately for us, the Things stayed pretty set. Stay. They were pretty. Uh, uh, what do I want to say? I can't say quiet. They were. Uh, they stayed with us. The French stayed with us the, just okay. about all the whole time we were there. But had been known. And that was some of the information we got. Watch the French. Make sure they don't leave. Uh, so what, um, which towns were you in then uh, when you were uh, supporting the battle? Uh, we were in uh, Atre, O-T-T-R-E. We were in Lierneau, L-I-E-R-N-E-U-X. 
and we got down to We got down to the same. We were to, to hold the Sen, Sen Fifth uh, Road, and I'm not sure the points where we. I think Vilsalm was V I E L S A L M. Was one location where that's is where we actually held our that we stopped there and and uh, we held that portion of the uh, Sainvith Highway. And the 2nd Armored came through our division and met the German tank corps and uh, fortunately did a very good job. Well, they were practically out of gas, so they really had no nothing to do with the fire. And I guess they just got to the point where it was time to surrender. Um, can you tell me some of your personal experiences during this time? Like, what was it like uh, these days? It was days? cold, a lot of snow. Uh, in Autry, we dug foxholes, and when you're trying to dig into frozen ground and all you have is a little shovel, it became a little little spade. It, it was quite difficult. Uh, but we did. And we had given a lot of our equipment, that is uh, clothing and so forth, blankets, whatever we had, to the infantry because they were, they were really suffering. And uh, consequently, we had one blanket for each of us and the temperature was down around I had gotten down to, I guess, close to 20 degrees. So that is zero. And were you outside? Uh... And we were outside. And uh, one of my replacements was a college professor. And uh, he and I, we th had a double foxhole. And we were in that foxhole. And we had, we put, to try to combat the cold, we put one blanket under us and one over us, and that's where we stayed. And uh, uh, I said, I told my wife this, I said, that's the first time I ever slept with a man. <laughs> but uh, you know, we, we stayed there for, I guess, maybe close to a week. And then when we moved up to um, uh, what, another little town, Fanzel, F-A-N-Z-E-L. That was on 122.45. So uh, what, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, about this time, uh, the waters came down to celebrate New Year's. So every weapon that we had in the division was fired. And uh, that's the way we celebrated New Year's there. And then uh, we moved on to uh, Jevigny, which is in Belgium, and that is J-E-V-I-G-N-E. -E. So what happened from that time to the end of the war? Till the end of the war. We, after we reorganized, uh, after the bulge, 
we uh, then headed east, and this is this became known as the Rat Race mm -hmm. because uh, um, General Patton and his Armored Corps was so far ahead of us, and the only thing that stopped them and it was around Trier in France was they ran out of gasoline. They had to wait for gasoline to come up. In the meantime, we took off. And uh, we became known as the ragtag rag tag, yeah, rag tag circus. And I, I have a, uh, um, I can I have a picture at home, and I can, I'll give it to Jim on Sunday. Um, but that was an experience. Every vehicle that we could abscond, we would take, whether it was a sedan, whether it was a, a, a pickup truck, no matter what it was, we got a, we took that in order to, because we had infantry. We only had a, a certain number of two and a half ton trucks that you could load the infantry on. We had everything else filled with men. So this is what we did. And one funny experience was while we were going down the road, this big sedan came, kept going in and out of it because we, we had space. We always spaced between the vehicles in case there was any incoming mail or anything. We could, there was space there to get out of the way. But anyhow, uh, it kept coming in and out, and finally someone we got near the front of the, the uh, convoy, someone said, where are they going? Well, they pulled out, uh, pulled out jeeps, and they blocked it. It was all German officers. <laughs> so we captured four high-ranking general officers. Just trying to weave and in we, and out? And we took the car. <laughs> they went back to POW camp, and we took the car. Is, uh, are there any other uh, stories that you wanted to, uh, anything else that you wanted to relate that we haven't uh, asked today? Uh, we, yes, there, when uh, in our pursuit across Germany, we were the first outfit to reach the Rhine. Okay. And uh, then we were also the first outfit to reach the Elba River, which was the boundary between the uh, uh, the Russians and the Americans. Uh, we actually forded the river and we got uh, information from our commanding general in Ninth Army, General Simpson, that we were going to take Berlin. So we had our division, we had put bridge across and we were at the, on the other side of the river, and uh, we were going. To the, we were getting artillery like you wouldn't believe. Every unit of artillery in the area was going to go with us, and uh, we were the was Second Armored Division, uh, the 83rd Division, and in uh, uh, reserve the Fourth Division. Okay. So uh, we. We had forded the river, and we were just waiting because we had no, no uh, uh, enemy fire. We had, were not under any siege or anything in that respect. So um, we stayed there, and then we got news to pull back, get back to the other side of the river because uh, at the Potsdam, uh, conference, uh, Roosevelt uh, agreed to let the Russians take Berlin. Mm -hmm. Now we we had all we were sending actually sending patrols into Berlin, and we weren't getting any fire. Matter of fact, the people were very cordial, and uh, so everyone had to pull back, and uh, so we stayed on the western side of the Elba River, uh, and then we got uh, Russians 
uh, came over interpreters and uh, they stayed with us until actually the time that the Russian army met the American army on the Elbe River. How were the German uh, civilians, how were they treating you? They treated us well. They really did. They had had enough of war. And uh, when you look at, if you ever look at some of the pictures, you see what we did to some of those cities, towns. Uh, I'll uh, bring, I also have some pictures of, in France of what the, some of the towns looked like. I'll bring them in on Sunday. But could you describe what they looked like? What did, what did you say? Well, how can I You've seen buildings here that have been uh, where they've had explosions. Mm -hmm. And all you see is just the, some of the structure there. Well, basically, that's what it was, except you also had piles of rubble from them. When you go down, would go down a street in town, you had nothing but rubble on either side of you. There was, there's one hotel that I have a picture of. Uh, you can see just what the, the bombings and the shelling did to that hotel. And that was the way it was throughout most of the part of Germany that uh, uh, we went through. Is there anything else that you wanted to uh, talk about today? There's one other thing I remember. On our way to, uh, we're rushing for the Elba River, we pulled over the convoy and we were on a road, a country road. Uh, suddenly we heard an airplane. It was a German fighter coming in. He's going to do a strafing run over us. We had the anti-aircraft unit with us. This is unbelievable, but they got that gun up in position. They fired one shot, killed the German, or put, they got the German plane. We rushed up to where the plane came down. It was all on fire. We got down there, but the, the pilot was on, in flames, so we didn't try to rescue him. Do anything. But it took one shot to save a convoy. Is that uh, experience or luck? I'd say luck. Yeah. They were good, but I don't think that they were that good. <laughs> they saved us frequently, but It's about, yeah, I don't, I don't think I provided very, very much information, but that's the best I can think of right now. Well, let's go off the record then for right now. We're back on. All right. Um, if you could then, I guess, just tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, what the daily, li daily living was like at this well, time. Um, have you ever heard of K-rations? Yes. Okay. We, when we landed in Normandy, it was K rations. We didn't get solid food until we got, had penetrated into France. And then we got what were called 10 to 1 rations. Mm -hmm. 10 to 1 rations were comprised of canned horse meat. Uh, we had, um, if you, where it's string beans got the name was because of the string on the string beans. We had string beans like that, and you had to sit there and pull the string off because they, otherwise they were not edible. Uh, we lived mostly on that type of food. We rarely had a, uh, uh, we had hot meals, but I'd say we sustained more from K rations and 10 to 1 rations because it depended on where the, uh, where we were as opposed to the, our division uh, 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 yeah. 
mess units. And uh, if they were close enough, we got hot food. For instance, in Jovigny, uh, we were in there. Uh, we, got, uh, we got hot meals the whole time we were there, mainly because uh, it, the area was becoming stagnant and uh, they could bring up the whatever we needed. Were you able to um, also live off the land uh, with uh, the... In, were you able to gather food from the uh, local populace? or There wasn't that much food. Yeah. Only one thing I remember, we were, we were out on a uh, mission, and uh, we happened to stop by this farm. In, this was in France. And uh, General, or the lieutenant and I got along very well. And he said, you know, when I was in college, he said, I could make the best steak. He said, everyone liked what I did. And he said, if you could find some vegetables and find a steak, I'll cook. Now there were only three, four, I had two, four, six, seven, or eight. There were eight people in the uh, group. And uh, so I sent them out foraging. I said, take cigarettes with you, take candy with you, which they did. Well, the one group came back with a steak that was about this big and about that thick. I said, how did you get that? They said, we gave up all the cigarettes and candy that we had, and they were happy to get them. So. So we brought them up. Another, two of my other agents came up and they had tomatoes. So we had the steak, tomatoes, and some leafy vegetable. I don't know what it was, whether it wasn't set, it wasn't lettuce, it was something else. So Lieutenant Rohrbaugh took all this and he, he fried it in the, the, the steak, you know, not fried, but he put it in there and, and, and cooked the vegetables. And we had a fabulous meal. Mm -hmm. The best one I think we had this while we were over there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, other than that, like, in, as I say, in Yavigny, we got uh, hot meals. Atre, we didn't. And in, in the cases like that, you always carried K rations or whatever. Yeah. Our first hot meal in Normandy was, uh, I guess we had, we're in about a month before we finally got, we did get one, uh, we have one, uh, they came in, let's see, the, the one, they came in with a, uh, a load of hams and uh, we were going to have ham until they opened the boxes. They were all green. You couldn't eat them, so they just had to throw them away. That was in Normandy. Um, but other than that, I don't remember having consistently having hot meals. Um, how did you uh, stay in touch with your with your family or your friends? By email. Email. Yeah. Did you get any uh, good letters from home? Oh yes, yes. How frequently would they would they arrive? Uh, well, since we had we were newly married, oh. and uh, I, I that's when I shipped away for two and a half years. But uh, I, my dear wife was, I knew I'm going to get a letter at least every other day, if not every week, or depending upon how fast they could get up to us wherever we were. But yeah, we and I would write back. So you married just before you shipped out? Or? Yeah. Yeah. And her father went down to City Hall with us in Philadelphia. And because my wife was not of age, and uh, he kept saying, are you sure you two want to go through with this? <laughs> we went through with it. 62 years of it, so we're all right. But yes, she was 
she did everything she could for me. Packages when I could get them. And, yeah. what, would, what would you have in a package? What would be there? What was in the package? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Gosh. Goodies, I know. Anything that, anything that wouldn't spoil right. or go stale. That's the best way of putting it. I, because for them to get chocolate bars or things like this I, were very difficult because of the, uh, uh, right. what did you have? What did you have? Rations. Rations. Yeah, the ration stamps. But uh, we, uh, we, we, you know, we subsisted on what we had over there. And we can't, I can't complain. Did you, ever, did you ever pull any pranks, or uh, was anybody pulled any pranks during the campaign? Well, let's see. I heard a lot. <laughs> yeah. My mind has gone blank. Really. Do you mean in the states or out of the states, or in, in, in combat or anything like that? No. Anything you'd like. No. Well, let's see. Yeah, in the states, in. Uh, we had uh, some Georgia crackers with us in Fort Bragg, and every sun, uh, Saturday they would go into town and come back with a suitcase full of liquor. And they were bar they were barracks right above us on the second floor, and they get into fights and they uh, they were terrible. So we finally decided when we went out for training, of course they went with us. We'd leave a couple of guys behind. And what they'd do, they'd go up and they'd take the corks or whatever it was on the whatever it had and empty it and fill it with water. <laughs> we all we almost had a riot and they found out what happened. That was one. And uh, oh we had another I didn't pull this prank, but we were in Noise Germany on the uh, on the Rhine River waiting to get across, and down at the end of the street, there was I didn't know this at the time, but there was a winery, and some of the guys got down there. They were following the women that well, there were some uh, immigrants. They, they could be Russian, they could be Romanian, they could have been anything, but. They were always going down to the end of the street. So a couple of guys followed them and they went in. Here they had these big casks of wine. Well, what they did was the guys went in and with their rifle butts, they knocked off the tap and wine was flowing all over. Well, started to wonder. These guys were walking up the street and they weren't doing a very good job of walking. So I sent a group down and I said, find out what's going on down there. They went down, the guys were, they were all bombed. <laughs> and uh, so we got them out and uh, got them away so that the officers wouldn't know what went on. But one guy wandered away and he went up the house where some of these people were housed, and he was banging at the door. Well, we always put out what we called M, you know, MPs, mm -hmm. and uh, they patrol the area. So they happened to be coming by this area, and here, this guy's banging on the door. So they went up, grabbed him, brought him back, and he <laughs> brought him back. They took him into the officers. The officers arrested him. The general was in the town of Noyce at the time with his staff. And uh, so they court-martialed him. And I happened to be at the door when the general was coming out and he said, I went to 10 years in Leavenworth. 
we're going to set an example. No more fraternization in my outfit. So he was court-martialed. He was sent back to the States. About two or three months later, one of his buddies got a letter. He had been sent over. They reviewed his case. They evidently said it was ridiculous. So they, dishonor they honorably discharged him. And he was working <coughs> at the time that he wrote this letter. <coughs> and uh, he said, I'm back here making a lot of money. What are you guys doing up there? <laughs> yeah, what, what the heck was his name now? I know it. He was from, I believe, from Ohio. I, can talk to, I know it. I'll have to give it to him his name. But yeah, we had some some good times considering, you know, what we were we had a we had a sergeant who later became a Pennsylvania representative and he was afraid of girls. And uh, not that he was, you know, odd in any respect, other than he was afraid of girls. He was raised in a family of seven women seven girls and one boy. And uh, we used to play tricks on him. We uh, were on going back to uh, Camp Atterbury. We were out in the field, and uh, the Red Cross girls came in with their donuts and coffee and so forth. So we got a, a, a couple of them to come over, and we said, look, we're going to put Sergeant Schumann in the tent, and then we're going to close the front uh, flap. The, you go in. He's afraid of girls. And they thought this was funny. Mm -hmm. So he went in. Uh, he went in. We opened a flap. The girls went in. And we could hear all this noise in there. Suddenly, Schumann, he was a bull. He really was. He got the back of the tent and he pulled it up and he took off out. <laughs> <laughs> and then Javigny, we um, we have there was a couple uh, young girls in there, and uh, we were in the basement of a house and because the rest of the house had been pretty well shot up. And uh, so we got Schumann down in there and uh, didn't force him. We just took him in, and I don't know what we said, but anyhow, got him in there, and he was explaining something to us when the two girls walked in. Well, there was a uh, like a... The oil, those big oil cans, you know, I yeah. don't know how many uh, barrels there, but right. anyhow. Schumann was up on the, the top of this barrel saying, go away, go away. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd say, oh, did, I'm going to, you're terrible, guy. get me out of here. So we got him out. But these are some of the things that, you know, you broke up the, not the monotony, but you 13. broke up some of the things that you could, would start thinking about. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, let's go off the record again. Yeah, I have something here for you. Good. Okay.